Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce this evening's lecture at Royal Society of Edinburgh. Welcome to everyone. It's good to see we've got another full house um, for a topic which could be hardly more relevant. I'll come to that in a moment. This evening's lecture comes together um, annually uh, really in memory of a man called Peter Wilson, who was an officer of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, he became its general secretary, he was a dynamo as far as this institution is concerned, and really played an enormous role in providing, the, the um, creating the um, facilities and the space and the, the buildings that we now have when he was general secretary. He was also an ecologist, played a big role in developing and bringing together the ecological interests um, within Scotland. And um, the, 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 the current um, organisation, which is a manifestation of that interest, is the Scottish Consortium of Rural Research, SCRR. <laughs> and um, to, tonight, the SCRR is combining with the Society of Biology to make this lecture possible. The Society of Biology itself has changed quite considerably recently because now the Society of Biology is a, a, is a consortium of all the biological sciences in the UK. As it happened, I played a role in bringing that um, slightly fractious marriage together. <laughs> and I um, won't, won't dwell on that. It took about six years, but that's... that's and I'm very pleased that that's all working and that, and that the Society of Biology um, this evening is a co-sponsor of the event. Getting to the event itself, our speaker this evening is um, on the board here, is uh, Alan Bel Belward, who is head of land management at the European Commission Institute for Environment and Sustainability, or ISPRA. He has played a really, really important part in uh, European ecological science. He began his work in the UK, but he, he now works at the European Commission, as I've said, um, and he's been there now for some time, and concerned in matters of policy. From 2002 to 2006, he chaired the Global Climate Observing Systems Organization, and if you look at the title of this, this talk this evening, Running Out of Land, A New Global Challenge, with what's happened in our country, in the UK, since just before Christmas, one can see land disappearing by the day. And one has to ask this question. Um, are we running out of land? How are we going to make the best use of our land? And how are we going to deal with the climate change which now is being talked of more definitely, um, which is going to take us into a future which is very uncertain with regard to land and water environments. So I think we could hardly have a better, um, a better speaker this evening, and I look forward very much uh, to that talk and hand over to our speaker now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll just lubricate the larynx. Um, yes, it's, it's a delight to be here this evening, and I feel very honored to be asked to give the, the, the lecture. Um, I'm going to talk to you about running out of land, about the, the, the growing pressure on this, this fragile resource that we have. And you'll see that there's a, a subtitle up there as well. There's Copernicus, because somebody once said, you, you can't manage what you, you can't measure. And that may be going a little bit far, but certainly policy making that's based on scientific evidence uh, is likely to have a better outcome than guesswork. And part of the evidence and part of the measurement is a brand new European program called Copernicus. It's the first time the European Union has had an Earth observation program. And I'm going to give you some background on the antecedents to that program and to tell you how it's engaging with the, uh, with the challenge of, of, of running out of land. Now, the sort of assumption that you have with any sort of land management work 
is that maps, which are one of the fundamental building blocks, blocks of land management decisions, you assume it's always there. The map's been made. Somebody has made the map. In this case, of, it's, it, it purports to be a soil classification map. If you go into the details, it's not actually. It's a land suitability map. It's saying which areas you can grow a limited range of crops on, which areas you can grow a large range of crops on. But the map is there. It's available. It's not locked away in some cabinet somewhere or classified or treated as a state secret. And in many parts of the world, that is not the case. Land and land information is extremely strategically important. And it's always accurate. Oh, well, that's quite an assumption. Now, in Great Britain, we've had maps for a long time. So we can almost assume that the map is there. Uh, this map was made 764 years ago. And even then, there was a reasonable amount of detail. You can see Hadrian's Wall is present. Uh, uh, the Antonine Wall is there. It's perhaps a little too far south because Edinburgh is there. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite correct. So maybe the accurate is not there. And this is the first problem we have with mapping or conventional forms of mapping is that it needs updating. And indeed, this map needed updating. And 110 years later, uh, Britain was remapped again. And we have the Gough map. In this case, it's an anonymous map. Gough was the man who owned it. It's not the man who made it. Paris was the man who made the previous one. Now, the map might look a little odd to you at first sight in that it's got east at the top. This is because in the medieval period when this map was made, it was quite normal to have the Orient at the top of the map because the notion of an earthly paradise was alive and well, and that was thought to be in the Orient. So it was always given pole position. So earthly paradise was given pole position. If we disorientate the map, that's also where the word orientate the map came from. You orientate the map because you point it towards the Orient. Uh, if we disorientate it and point it north-south and compare it to one of my beloved satellite images, you see that our our mysterious and anonymous medieval map maker wasn't too bad. And in fact, if we come up on Edinburgh, you'll see already that there was a remarkable amount of information being held 600 odd years ago. But it's static. And we had to wait 500 years before technology caught up with us and started to give us the first push towards the Copernicus program, towards a European Earth observation program. Photography was developed in uh, in Europe, and within about 30 years of the first photographs coming out, this enterprising fellow called uh, Gaspard Félix Tournachon decided to put a camera in a balloon and take it up, because if you got above the action, you got a much better view of the land surface. This is his publicity uh, document, and if you look at the detail in the wordings, I, can you read it? It says, applications, cadastre, strategy, etc. In 1858, they were proposing the use of aerial photography to measure cadastre, the building block of land ownership and land taxation. So right then, the fundamentals of who owns what, what is where, what is being used from where, was being determined from a balloon. But it was aerostatic, and static is not the answer to everything. So we moved forward with... Uh, our unmanned aerial vehicles. <laughs> and we have our, our drone, if you like. And this was the Bavarian Pigeon Corps. And the Bavarian Pigeon Corps of 1903 was truly wonderful. You attached a little clockwork camera to a pigeon and you let it go, and the pigeon took photographs on its way. Photographs that you can distinguish forests and you can distinguish openings and urbanization and pigeon wingtips as well, if you look at the edges of the photograph. But you had one frame with, one without, one with, and you, could, you, know, you can work forwards, as it, as it were. Then things got really crazy when the Russians launched Sputnik. Now, Sputnik didn't image anything, but it did raise one whole new perspective for people interested in land, and that's space space rather than airspace. Airspace, even if you're the Bavarian Pigeon Corps, is controlled. You can't overfly someone else's territory very easily. But from space, you can. And suddenly, the capacity for global observing was very real. 
Um, and within a year or two of the first satellite being launched, we got the first images of the land surface or the surface, the Earth's surface. This is actually the Pacific Ocean from space. I must admit, when I saw that, I did think at that point, how on earth did my science ever advance? Because you look at that and think, wow, <laughs> not much we can do with that. But within a year, we were getting detailed imagery like this. Now, this was from a military satellite. So our premise of our opening slide where we said that data are available, this was not available. This was highly classified. So the information on land cover and land cover change that was coming from that in 1960 was open to very, very few people. Now, if I look in Google Earth and I look inside the little green, uh, sorry, the little yellow square there, I find this image from that Russian uh, airfield publicly available. And that is a fundamental point for any sort of land management strategy uh, information supply because it means that we have transparency. The data are there, they are open. And in December of last year, the European Union's Copernicus program signed into law full, free, and open access to data. So the data that our Earth observing, our land observing satellites are going to collect will be available to anybody. And that's really important when it comes to hiding what you're doing to the land because somebody's looking at it. And in fact, if we look at where all of that started, the very first satellite that was truly civilian, truly global, truly land-based was Landsat. And Landsat 1 was launched in 1972. And within, what's that, that's July 1972, by August 1972, we got our first satellite image of Edinburgh. And you have the west of the city there. Most of the territory appears to be under cloud. Um, <laughs> Perhaps that's not so unusual. <laughs> Within six months, we had got a rather beautiful cloud-free image. This is the earliest scene of the Edinburgh area I can find without cloud on it from the archives available to us. Now, we can do rather better than that from space now. And the civilian satellite Earth observing community has access to data as good as this. This is not military. It's in the public domain. And if I go in and show you the full detail, we look at the tennis courts we see the tennis players playing. And you can see who's serving and who's receiving by their position on the court. Now, I'm not interested in tennis players, but I am interested in land surface processes. And with these sort of data uh, accessible anywhere in the world, you start to build up a notion of transparency that you can observe what's going on. So how many are actually up there? Well, in 1957, we had Sputnik on its own. Uh, that's not to scale, by the way, uh, just in case you were thinking Sputnik was really that big. Um, since then, and I checked this morning, 7,080 satellites have been launched. So it's getting pretty crowded up there. And the European Union's satellites that are soon to be launched will be joining 7,080 others up there. Satellites have started crashing into satellites. The first incident happened in 2009 when a, a defunct uh, telecommunication satellite wiped out a, 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 a US one. And that was a bad crash. Ecuador, it was terrible. Ecuador's space program came to an end one month after it began. They launched their first satellite last year, and within one month, it was hit by space junk. Now, we have a European satellite called Envisat, which we lost control of. Uh, in 2012, and Envisat's about 10 meters long, four by four high and wide. It weighs eight tons. It's traveling at 14,000 miles an hour, and there's no one at the wheel. It's not being flown. We, we have no control over it. If that hits something, then we will get some sort of perpetuating crisis almost. So it's an issue. So there are satellites hitting satellites. There are also satellites imaging satellites. Uh, you could say that the European Space Agency's ERS-1 satellite got in the way because the French satellite that imaged it failed to image the land surface underneath. Um, but there's just so many up there now that we have a wealth of information available to us. In 1972, there was one, Landsat 1, that we saw at the beginning. By 
1982, there were eight. 92, there were 20. Today, there, were, there are something like 93 operational polar orbiting imaging satellites. And there is a point to this. And that point is that there are many countries in the world, 31 actually, investing in this technology because they want to control the flow of information about their land territory. If you remember, I started by saying that space space is not controlled in the same way as airspace is controlled. Now, you do not want other countries knowing more about your land resource than you know about your land resource. So there's almost, not rather than redundancy, it's almost competition. But the more people that put them up, the more people that put them up, because you don't want to be left out of the information game. And there is an element to that. If we look around the world as to where those are being launched, uh, it's fascinating that there are African countries launching these now. There are the obvious ones, the, the, the China and India, big players now in the space game. America is the biggest. It has the longest history. Russia not far behind. Some noticeable gaps. Australia has no capacity. But last year, Australia launched a public policy document <laughs> saying, should Australia continue to be lost in space? Because there is this strategic need to know what's happening in our territory, what's happening in others' territory. And so the European Union has put together the Copernicus program. Now, we, I said it's a new program. It is at the European Union level. But Europe itself has a long history of building Earth-observing satellites. These are just some examples of various ones that... Uh, that have been built in Europe over the last uh, uh, 40 years or so. Um, the one showing the aircraft taking off on the runway, that's the latest one. That's a French satellite that was launched just last year. There are all sorts of significant ones. The one in the top left corner from Thailand, that's the sort of data that we can get globally every day. Uh, the bottom right with the pyramids in it is a radar satellite image. And radar is peculiar stuff in that can see through cloud and it can see day and night. So it provides all sorts of wonderful land imaging capabilities. Now, the, that heritage has given rise to three classes of European satellite, the first of which will be launched in just a few weeks' time, on the 28th of March this year. Sentinel-1 will be launched. It's a radar satellite. A little bit like Nadar with our, our French balloonist, we don't see the technology as a means in its end. It's driving services. And so those satellites have been put up to drive a whole series of services in the public good. Climate change, climate change service being the obvious one, security, atmospheric modeling, marine monitoring, looking at things like wave height and wind speed and, and sea surface temperature. Emergency management, post-crisis, the flooding that we were talking about in the introduction, that's being mapped um, as part of that uh, crisis response. And then land monitoring, which is where my department comes in. And what we're interested in with the land monitoring is looking at the balance, in terms of the balance between different land uses globally. The land has to feed us, so the land has to produce food. We were talking over coffee before the lecture about energy a little bit. And the land is a fundamental supplier of energy. This photograph of the two gentlemen with bicycles was taken by one of my colleagues outside Dar es Salaam. Uh, it was about an hour by Land Rover. I don't know how many hours by bicycle. But they were collecting fuel wood. The gentleman at the back has charcoal in his bags. That's an awful lot of wood he's had to cut down to make that much charcoal. The gentleman in the front, it's a more obvious wood fuel. 600 million people in Africa, if they want to cook something, set fire to a bit of wood. They have no other energy source. And that requires land, land for energy. Then there's timber and fiber for building, for paper, and of course, for foundations, for roads, for houses, for building. Uh, Ironically, that photograph of the new development, I took that at the launch of Landsat 8. That was just outside the launch pad area. And they were taking this lovely productive agricultural land and going to put houses on it. So uh, there's that competition there between food and fuel and fiber and building the foundations. 
But then there is the global scale services that the land and land cover delivers to us. And yes, the planet is a blue planet, the blue marble. Um, Two-thirds ocean, one-third land. Take the barren areas and the desert away, and you're left with about 20% of the planet's surface being covered in vegetation. Don't think of it as area, but think of it as leaf area. Take all the leaves off those plants and spread them out, and you would cover the entire planet's surface. So that's a large surface area for atmosphere-surface interactions. And in fact, that process is visible in probably the most famous of our climate change graphs that we have, the Keeling curve, showing that inexorable rise in atmospheric CO2 concentration. But you see the sawtooth on it. It peaks around May of each year and then drops. And the drop is as the northern hemisphere, the leaves and the vegetation, absorb CO2. So you have the trend going up, but you have the sawtooth effect because of the planet's vegetated surface. Then we have biodiversity. How many people are familiar with this beast? The soil scientists should be. Uh, it's a tardy grade. It's one of the fundamental parts of the soil food web, if you like. Um, it looks remarkably like my dog as well, which is a bit unfortunate for the dog. But, we, we tend not to think of soil and the land. We, th we tend to think of land as the reservoir for biodiversity in terms of supporting tropical forests. But the soil itself is a fundamentally important reservoir of soil. And there have estimates been made that 45 tons per hectare of living material is found in the top meter or so of temperate soil. Now, that area of grassland in the front there is about a hectare. 45 tons per hectare is the equivalent of 900 sheep, weight-wise. There are 900 sheep there because I put them on. It was a long and sleepless night, but there were 900 <laughs> sheep on there. Now, what you find happening, though, is there is some argument that agriculture eats biodiversity. Because if you compare the biodiversity in a meter or so of cropped soil rather than a natural or a more natural habitat, you find much less. And in fact, cropped land is usually something like five tons or, or 100 sheep. Now, that's because of the compaction, because you've got monoculture going on there. You've replaced the multiple species of a grassland ecosystem with the single crop that you're growing. And the Food and Agricultural Organization have estimated that most of our food comes from something like 30 plant species and four animals, pigs, chickens, sheep, and cows. Is that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, the problem we're facing on a global scale is if the land is an important reservoir of biodiversity and we need to protect it, how much do we need to protect and where are we going to protect it? At the Convention for Biological Diversity's conference of the parties in 2010, all the governments of the world that are parties to that conference came together and they said, we will increase the protected area of the planet from its current 12% to 17%. But given the demands for food, for fuel, for fiber, where on earth are we going to cite those? And so that's a first challenge is, do the protected areas that are already in place work? Do they protect the biodiversity they're supposed to protect? If we're going to cite new ones, where do we cite them? And these are, these are some of the challenges that we are addressing uh, through, through the, the, this program. Now, to give you some idea of the, the criticality of that decision-making, you think that 99% of the calories come from the land. Okay, but how much of the land can actually provide us with calories? And if we go through and we eliminate all those areas that are actually <coughs> too cold for crops to grow, take them out. Then we take out the areas that are too high, get rid of those. Then we take out the areas which are too hot, take those out. We take out the areas which are too wet, kind of a, a topic of the day, I guess, but let's take those out. Incidentally, they weren't in the Somerset levels, were they? Ah, maybe this map's not accurate after all. <laughs> but then we take out the too acidic, take out too saline, take out 
the areas that are already sealed up by concrete for cities or underwater in the form of a lake. Maybe that's the Somerset levels. Um, then we have the areas that are too sandy, too low fertility. It's not that they're not used for agriculture, but they require careful use of agriculture. It can't be intensive agricultural use. We get rid of the soils that are, are too young and too developing, too prone to degradation, and we're left with something around 13 to 18%. Now, the first point is that's not a big number. The second point is we have no idea what the error bars are on that. We're still working on building up the maps. 13 to 18% is a huge range when you're talking globally. Um, but the significant point is that much of the land is not sustainably, not suitable for intensive sustainable agriculture. And even some of that that is, is susceptible to change with climate change or erosion or degradation. It's under threat. What's even worse is what we as humans are doing on the planetary scale already. This is a map that was made in, in our department in collaboration with the World Bank. And it's a surrogate for urbanization. Uh, it's actually travel time. It's the time it will take you to reach a city of 50,000 people or more. So it's a good estimator of urbanization and the infrastructure that's associated with it, roads and railways. You can see by looking at the map, if it's gold, you're within one hour of a city. If it's dark, you can be the most remote places in the middle of the, of the Gobi Desert, and it would take you three weeks to reach a city of 50,000 from there. But essentially, you can see that Europe is vastly urbanized. This brings us on to an argument that we're looking at called land take, which is taking productive land out of the agricultural cycle. And at the moment, we've estimated from a series of satellite maps, that the land take rate in the European Union is approaching 1,000 square kilometers a year. That's 25 square meters a second. That's something like six, eight seconds for this, this lecture theater. That's what's being lost. So urbanization is physically taking land out of production. But there are two other hits that take place because the second thing is that you're taking people away from the rural areas. They tend to be migrating into the cities. So there are fewer people to work what's left outside the cities. And the third is an economic argument, which is as people move to the cities, their income tends to go up. And the first thing people spend their extra money on is better food. And as you take your food further up the production line, you need more land to produce the same amount of calories. And so this argument, you're hitting three times the food security uh, dimension with that one process. So we're looking very much at the competition for land. It's this eternal triangle. It's environmental pressure of land degradation and climate change. It's societal pressure of population growth and population migration. And it's economic pressure on choice in terms of which sort of food stuff or energy that, you're, that you're, you're producing. So those three coming together give us a, a, a terrible uh, pressure on, on the land resource. Now I can illustrate that a little bit by looking at the history of this region. Um, we can look at Edinburgh from our, our satellite images. This is a zoom up on the city from that very first cloud-free image from 1973. You can't see an awful lot on it. If we step forward in time and we look at 1988, then we have a better satellite, and I think things become far more visible to you. Um, if you look inside the little yellow circles, that's the area I'd like you to concentrate on. And I'm going to step forward from 1988 until last year. And in 2013, you suddenly see a whole load of infill. Let's go back, and you can look at how, look at how the airport expands. Look at the infill around the ring road. Look at the changes in the coastal area where we were talking about the gasometer and the regeneration there, you'll even see some infill in the harbor. Now, we're not making new land. We've moved land. We've moved it from somewhere else and stuck it in the harbor. So don't be misled to think that that, that process is making new land. It's, it's, it's moving it around. So those are changes on a reasonably dramatic scale in, in Edinburgh. Move to somewhere else in the world, though, and the situation is rather different. This is Whoops, I've hit two there. This is Chongqing in China in 1988. 
And I don't need to draw yellow circles on here because in 1988, that was a city of 2 million. And in 2013, that is a city of 29 million. That city is producing a new map of its urban boundary, an official map, every month. It's growing so fast. It's producing, uh, uh, I think, every month. Now, that's urbanization, but there are other land cover changes that we're observing around the planet which are equally dramatic and equally profound. That was, just to give you a sense of scale, that was the, the little box that we were looking at of Edinburgh earlier in detail. And I'm now going to go to the same size area, but in a different part of the world. This is in Saudi Arabia, 1987, 1991. 2000, 2012, 2013. Now, every one of those little circles is an irrigation point. Put it into perspective. That's where it would spread. So before, we were looking at small-scale change around Edinburgh Airport or around the Ring Road. In that same time period, since 1987, 1988, that much land has been transformed in Saudi Arabia. And every one of those circles is a quarter of a mile long irrigation boom, which is pumping fossil water. And it's pumping it at a remarkable rate because it's a very hot, very dry, very arid. It, that area does not fall on our map of sustainably productive agricultural soils. To produce from there, which you can, you can produce a lot, they can hit yields of up to eight tons a hectare. But in doing that, they are putting tremendous demands on the resource base. They're using something like 600,000 gallons of water a day per field. And there are 2,500 fields. And if you multiply that up, that's 75 million gallons, which is enough for every man, woman, and child in Scotland to have 14.16 baths a day, which is an awful lot of baths. Now, we are recognizing all of that politically. And the, the 140 governments came together in Rio to look at the post-Rio conferences, the climate change, the biodiversity, and the desertification conference. They came together uh, in 2012 and came up with a political statement recognizing the importance of soil and land and the importance that the need to nurture it and, and care for it. And, the European Commission has translated that into an action plan. And my department is actually working on three elements of that action plan. We're working on a new atlas of global land degradation, monitoring it with satellite, looking at the changes in the productivity of the vegetation to build up an atlas, a world atlas of desertification. We're looking at building up the fundamental soil maps to try and reduce the error bar on that 13 to 18% uncertainty. And that's through the Global Soil Partnership. So working with different groups of soil scientists around the world to, to build up accurate soil, soil maps. And we're also looking at biodiversity in the protected areas. And I just want to illustrate how the satellite program and the biodiversity program come together in, in one, one case. We have this thing called the Digital Observatory for Protected Areas. What that does is brings together the official maps of the protected areas that are held by the World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge. It brings together all of the species data lists, the red lists that are held by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it brings together dynamic observations of the environment from satellite. And we're looking at things like surface water, the growth and contraction of, of, of seasonal water bodies. We're looking at fires, bushfires. Where do they occur? Do they occur inside parks, outside parks? And we're looking at vegetation productivity. And we're looking at threats to the park, land cover change. How intensively is the land around the park being used? And I give you one example from Africa. What we do is we take every degree latitude by longitude, as a sample. So we've got 2,000 something sample points over Africa here. At each degree latitude longitude intersect, we go through the archives and we find a satellite image from each few years with which we can track the changes to the land cover. So I start off with this one. This is in 1975. 
and it's essentially undisturbed natural vegetation. Move forward, 1984, much of the same, actually. Not much happened between 75 and 84 in this location. 2000, and you start to see things happening on the right-hand side of the image. You start to see it being broken up, and you see the geometric shape of fields appearing. 2009, 2013, I would say that those citizens have run out of land. The straight line that you now see more or less in the middle is the boundary of a protected area. And now the choice is, is very real. You have no more land to expand your cultivated area. What is the rationale for still protecting the other forests? So there are hard decisions to be made. And this allows us to at least say that protected area is being extremely well managed. There is not illegal land clearance going on inside it. And when we step forward and we look at the changes for every single one of those degree latitude longitude intersects, we can build up a picture of how the land cover of the whole continent is changing. The red circles are where land has degraded or been transformed into agriculture, so natural vegetation has been lost. The size of the circle is indicative of the amount of change. The bigger the circle, the bigger the change. The green triangles are where there's been some regeneration and regrowth. And between 1990 and 2000, there are a reasonable number of green triangles in evidence. If we go from 2000 to 2010, we find most of the green triangles going and most of the red circles getting bigger. The pressure on the environment is inexorable, basically. The land resource is being consumed. And in fact, it's something like 50,000 square kilometers of natural vegetation every year that is being either converted or degraded for that continent. And the reason is very clear. It's population growth. Africa has the fastest growing population in the world. In 1975, the population of Africa was half that of Europe. By about 1999, 1999-2000, they hit parity. And since 2000, the population of Europe has grown by 10 or 11 million, and the population of Africa has grown by 210 or 11 million. And it's continuing to grow. And it's predicted to, to, to continue in that rise for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So the pressure is enormous, and that will lead to challenges of food insecurity, of conflict, and, and indeed issues like land grabbing. Now, it's not just the process of land for agriculture that we're looking at. It's also using forests and land in a sustainable manner uh, centrally. These are the sort of satellites that the Sentinels are going to, going to be. There'll be one like this launched uh, in a, a year's time. One, if I zoom up on the, on the Congo Basin, you'll get imagery like this within two months. This is what the Sentinel-1 imagery will look like, um, which allows us to see through clouds. And then we will get our Sentinel-3 data like this within a year or so every day. You'll get a picture like this every day. And then we come in a little bit more detailed and we'll get pictures like this every five days. Now, I've just zoomed in further and further and further on a logging concession in the Congo Basin. And what you see there are logging roads in the forest. The ones in the center appear bright blue because they're still being worked. There are trucks driving up and down them. So you're getting the spectral signature basically of bare soil. Over to the edge of the image, the roads appear to be orangey because in fact the trucks are no longer driving up and down them and there's vegetation regenerating on those tracks. So we, using this, we can monitor whether a concession is being used or not. The, the level of use is, is observable. And in fact, if we go in even more detail, and we start to go in with our higher resolution satellite imagery, we start to see individual tree canopies. Those are individual trees that you're looking at, like the tennis court picture. But instead of looking at tennis players, we're looking at tropical trees. Go over time, and you see where each individual tree has been taken out. And so we can measure the number of trees per hectare that are being extracted. More important, well, just as importantly, we can also tell whether trees are not being extracted. And there are new policy directions like reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation where 
the premise is we will pay countries to leave their tropical forest intact, undisturbed. Very good, but can we monitor that? And the answer is with this sort of technology, yes, you can determine whether the forest is disturbed or, or undisturbed. So we're working on detecting illegal logging. Uh, you've heard of blood diamonds, and there's also blood timber. It, it is a big issue around the world. Um, and in fact, the European Union is a, is a key supporter of something called forest law enforcement, governance, and trade. And that's bringing us on to an area where we're actually getting tax dollars in for the first time because we're able to control where the uh, logs are going and, and where they're being cut. Now, we're measuring this throughout the tropics, and we're building up a picture of deforestation change globally. The drivers are different in different parts of the world, it does have to be said, although the process is the same, we're losing trees. If we start off in, in Southeast Asia, here you've got one of the largest paper mills in the world in Riau province. You've also got one of the very last fragile tropical forests on a peat bog. Unfortunately, what's happening, unfortunately from my perspective, from other people it's not unfortunate because it's going to bring in money, people are going in and they are plowing it and draining it, drain the peat bog, leave it to dry out for long enough, bring in heavy duty machinery, fell the trees, float them in the drainage channels down to the paper mill. So that's what's happening there. In Africa, the logging is rather well controlled, I have to say. Uh, that's not such a massive issue. There are other issues, though, like illegal charcoal production. We saw the energy demand earlier. Now, the Virunga National Park, for example, makes less than a million dollars from tourism a year, but it's likely to pull in something like $30 million a year from illegal charcoal production. So the threat is enormous. Then in Latin America, there's the obvious one, the transformation of land for ranching. You're familiar with the notion of the burger supply chain starting in clear cuts of forests. They're, they're, they're huge producers of meat now, uh, the Amazon region. But there's also other issues. There is logging. It, it accounts for about 6% of the deforestation there. But there's urbanization. And urban generation in Amazonia is an issue just as it is in parts of China. There are something like 20 million people living in cities inside the Amazon itself. Now, if you look at the, the, the little black box in the center of the screen and we zoom up on that, you can see that process again from the satellite. In 1973, it was completely verdant, unbroken forest. Step forward to last year, and we have vast chunks of the forest disappearing. If we zoom up on it, you can see that process in more detail. You start off with unbroken forest, and then you have a network of roads being put in, and those roads breed deforestation. They allow access. Access means people can go in and clear clear the forest. And you can see how that process is beginning on the right-hand side of the, the river as well as the, the left-hand side of the river there. So we're summing it all up, bringing it all together, doing this like we did in Africa, line by line, building up the statistics, and getting quantitative measurements of land cover change. And in the humid forests at the moment, we're estimating something like 5.8 million hectares a year being lost. That's net loss. That's accounting for reforestation and afforestation. So it's after that's been taken into account. That sort of number is quite difficult to visualize. And so given the six nations, we decided to put it on a rugby field. And because we're passionate, we put it on the Stade de France. And rather than having the Stade de France as it is, we put trees on it, which is sometimes preferable. <laughs> um, and within about three seconds, we are losing a Stade de France of forest. Every three seconds of every day. So whatever you're doing, brushing your teeth or whatever it is, every three seconds, a Stade de France worth of forest has gone. So things are happening rapidly. And so I, I, I believe that 
global land resource monitoring is a, is a scientific imperative because we have to reduce the error bars on that uncertainty in the rates of deforestation, in our uncertainty in the amount of soil available for agriculture, in the uncertainty of rates of land degradation. We signed up to a land degradation neutral world without putting in place a measure of land degradation neutrality. So the government said, yes, we'll do it, but they haven't actually thought, and they've given themselves a target, a land degradation neutral world but nobody actually knows what land degradation neutrality is yet. So it's a scientific imperative. It's an economic imperative because of the, the fact that so much money is tied up in land. It's, it, it, it's a hugely valuable resource in real monetary terms, never mind biodiversity and carbon sinks. It's a strategic imperative. Food security is a national concern as well as a moral imperative. The poor of the world are most vulnerable to climate change. The poor of the world are most vulnerable to land degradation. The poor of the world are even vulnerable to land grabbing. We've talked about land take with the expansion of the cities, but land grabbing, which of course is nothing new, it a, was a colonial pastime after all, but in recent times, you've got something like, what did I say, it was five million hectares of land being degraded or transformed into agriculture in Africa Let's say half of that is new agricultural land. But something like 40, 50 million hectares have been subject to land deals where one country, I'm not going to name names, you know who I'm talking about, one country is buying land from another country. And so land take, and sorry, land grabbing is becoming, a, 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 I think, a, a, a profound uh, charge on us all. And we need to act. We need to act very fast. We passed the 7 billion mark. We passed it in 2011. We've been adding to that at the rate of 155 extra people a minute. So time is not on our side. And so the final slide is that land is really a a non-renewable resource. It takes a hundred years to make a centimeter of soil in temperate grasslands, in that biologically rich area with the 900 sheep on it. Not that you can put 900 sheep on a hectare of land. That would be a very foolish thing to do. But it's non-renewable, effectively. People don't think of it as non-renewable, but it is. And it needs to be respected. It needs to be respected by everybody. It's too easy to think of we need to put houses here and roads here, there needs to be some thought going into where we're citing some of these things. We have to protect it. We have to produce more with polluting less. I think that's a, a, a concept which is quite familiar to many people. We have to ensure fair and transparent and sustainable rights of use. And if you're going to have to have rights of use, you've got to establish who owns the land. So we're right back to Nadar and his balloon and the cadaster. And one of the things that we're using some of the very high resolution data for is on checking cadastres, the actual boundaries between plots of land. And I think the scale of the problem is such that science and, and innovation are absolutely indispensable. We will not produce more without excellent research in terms of crop production, in terms of agricultural engineering, in terms of irrigation techniques, in terms of soil management. Otherwise, we will not be able to produce more without polluting less. And I think on the global scale, getting that balance is important for us all. It's just as important to us that we maintain the protected areas in Tanzania as it is for the Tanzanians. It's important to us that we protect the global forests because the global forests are such an important part of the global climate system. So it has an effect. What happens in Amazonia affects you here in Edinburgh as well. So I think that Getting that, that balance right on the global scale is absolutely critical. And I think the Earth observation, or I hope I've given you some feel for how Earth observation and the satellites are beginning to help us gain that information in an open and in a transparent uh, and in a fairly understandable manner. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and leave you with the last slide. And then you can see where our logo came from as well. That's, that's our headquarters in Brussels. That's the Berlimont building. And you can see the inspiration for the European Commission logo. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I mean, that is uh, an incredible um, lecture that Alan has just presented us with, and we've got time for discussion. We can't let this kind of very sobering presentation about what's happening to the land on our earth go without having a proper discussion about it. I mean, and I think you did a great job, Alan, because not only did you show the, the immense power of the modern technology with the satellites and the image analysis and so on, which then leads to the amazing statistics. Mm. But I don't think anybody will forget the Stade de France unit. <laughs> I'm serious about that. You know, the Stade de France unit is a disappearance of that area within three minutes? Three seconds. Three seconds. seconds. Three seconds. seconds. Right. Yes. So it is staggering. Um, maybe I could just kick off by saying you're obviously involved in a hugely international effort. Mm. Wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do this work if you didn't have international agreement. Mm. And the, what you have discovered is, is intensely concerning um, in terms of the future of, uh, of, the, of our civilization. But what evidence is there at the other end of this international work of joint action? The Global Soil Partnership. That's one piece of evidence. I, I think that, that when people commit to, to combining their efforts, that's, that's a good example. The World Atlas of Desertification. We haven't had a consistent measure of land degradation and desertification since 1992. And that last one was a very um, non-quantitative approach. And now we're using a quantitative measure from the satellites. So... Those are, those are two examples. I think the very fact that the politicians all came together and agreed to a land degradation neutral world as a goal is worthy. Um, the fact that they forgot to specify what land degradation neutrality was was an unfortunate lapse. <laughs> but we're, we're getting there. The, the, the next move has happened. They're, they're convening an, a new international working group now to say, all right, how do we measure this? What is a realistic and uniform and transparent way of, of measuring land degradation neutrality? So those are some examples. Yes, I'm going to invite questions now, but the, qu the next question is, you know, when will it make a difference to living conditions, health and welfare, especially with the rapid growth of the population, but you don't need to answer that at the moment. I'll think about that yes, one. We were saying it's a good question and I'll think about it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so there, there are microphones uh, down at the, um, the corridors. Please stick your hand up. Tell us who you are and, and ask a question cogently, please. Right in the centre here. Uh, James Irvin, a farmer in Perthshire. Could I actually bring things down to earth a little bit to make a bit of a pun and actually <laughs> comment on the first-hand knowledge of how land is being used at mm. home here in Scotland mm -hmm. and actually in England. And it causes for great concern, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, the rivers are not being managed properly and that's not just down in the Somerset levels, it's throughout the whole of the UK. There is no proper management for the rivers and that is causing very considerable unnecessary damage to valuable Scottish agricultural land and elsewhere. When you come as um, having been a farmer there for 25 years or more, it's very clear that there's an imbalance between the soft con uh, conservation policies and the actual practical good management of agricultural land, which is being inhibited by many things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at trees, for example, there is not the proper control of the spread of diseases in trees, which causes huge uh, destruction throughout Europe on failure to control uh, diseases in trees. Right? Um, and also you get the problem of excess restrictions on soft conservation, which seem to be achieving remarkably little, while the valuable land production and good balance is being inhibited. So, you know, what we're looking for is a much better balance between competent land management, competent management of the rivers, 
which the landowners can't afford to do. They're left with a mess of the river for 15 years. So I can express my concern that all is not well at home in how land is being managed. Mm -hmm. Alan? Well, I mean, the, the scales that my particular department are addressing are, are, are global rather than, than, than national. But within the Copernicus program, there is a, a emergency management program which is trying to document the scale at least. So it's, it's part of that evidence-based, uh, again, over coffee we're talking about the need for evidence-based for, for, for policy making. And when you're looking at the scale of the problem that you're saying, one thing that we will be able to do quite clearly from the satellites is to document the true physical scale of the problem. Now, it's not on the human scale. I, I do appreciate that. But at least we're producing some evidence, yeah. which then, of course, we've got to get our policy counterparts to listen to. Right. Another question in the front here. If you could keep it quite short, please. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Professor Eric Sorton, ex-biologist and psychologist. Um, a terrifying picture that yeah. you paint, magnificent detail, but only confirming what anyone who was observant, knew that what was happening in the world. But what worries me is that, I mean, the, the driving force behind all this is human population. And I'm just afraid that what you're I mean, following with will lead to actions which are essentially sticking plaster. Who is doing anything about stopping the increase in population and reducing the world population? In the end, it's got to happen. Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very emotive question. I think, uh, what I, for now, I would put more faith in, I think we have to put faith in science right now and innovation to reduce the impact that we're having on the land, to make sure that we can continue the, the good management of the land as our, as our farmer colleague raised before. Um, we have to be able to increase yields and we have to do that through very careful crop selection processes and soil management. I think that, that the essence of my, uh, the, the direction I'm coming from is that the soil itself should be valued because that just by intensive agricultural use in a careless way, which is not, I know, the case universally and a lot of farmers have tremendous respect for the land. Um, but we have to be able to get more out of it than less, and I think that technology and science, looking at ways of reducing compaction, ways of increasing efficiency of irrigation, minimizing fertilizer input, that can all have an effect. I'm sure that um, questions like, you know, where are we going from here? How on earth can we control things? How can we make things better? Are very relevant. We'll have more of that. What I would say is that I think I'm correct, uh, Alan, in saying that since the beginning of this new century, that revolution of, in terms of the technology about what we know about this earth and what, how it's being used and how it's changing has, has arrived. We didn't know that before. If we didn't have this progress, we still wouldn't know it. It's, I mean, we've got progress. I think mm -hmm. the, the questions in the audience is, mm. what do you do with that progress? Mm. Okay? Well, uh, again, coming back to the previous question of, of when you said that we all know this. Yeah. I mean, in, in, our, in our gut, we know it. But what we're able to do it now yeah. is to perhaps to document it yeah. in a more scientifically robust manner. Um, the, the, the deforestation is a good example, actually. The, the earlier estimates of deforestation yeah. were far greater than those current ones. We're observing globally, and again, this comes back to your earlier question about the global impact. We have noted a reduction in the rates of deforestation globally. And partly, it's because of the transparency. Yes. It's because it's not so easy to illegally cut yeah. down a forest chunk and sell it on the black market. Your people in your country will know you've done that now because they can have access to the satellite imagery but to we, check it. Right, yes. Okay, we'll come back to population again, I'm sure. Um, next question from the front row. Ian Bainbridge from Scottish Natural Heritage. I was interested in the series of maps that you showed us which led you down to the 13 to 18% <laughs> of croppable land. Mm. But I was 
very interested in that what you were left with didn't include large areas of land that aren't cropped but are nevertheless providing animal proteins. Is it the case that in, world or, in, the, in the overall world order, animal proteins produce a very insignificant amount of the food product that's coming from a terrestrial source? Ooh, that's a good question, and I'll have to think about it. <laughs> no, I, I do sort of have an answer. Um, I think that there have been some rough calculations on the, the amount of land that you need to produce the same calories from meat and from cereals, and you need four times the land to produce calories from meat than from cereals at least four times. So in that respect, yes. Um, also, much of the land that, that you're referring to, which does, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the, the, I guess that the stocking rates are relatively low. Um, but the point is there. But you need far more land to generate the same amount of calories as you do from, from cereal crops. Yes, towards the back. Ian Gordon, uh, James Hutton Institute. Um, we've, we've only really been able to see from the space since 1982. And so actually there's been a lot of land use change, particularly in Europe, and has happened uh, um, prior to that. Is there any way you can use a signal from what is happening between 1982 and now to assess historically what has happened yeah. in different places? Hmm. Uh, gosh, I'm really stumped by that one. Um, hindcasting, yeah. going backwards. Uh, it's not something I've tried. Um, I'm guessing that it's possible, but I can't think how you do it right now. But what we... I can't answer. <laughs> I'm going to give up on that one. <laughs> right in the centre of that row. <laughs> If you have a, if you think about it, uh, let yes. us know, right? <laughs> My name's Andrew Hield. I'm a, I'm a forester. Um, do you have any easy solutions? Do you have any quick, <laughs> quick wins? Is there a, what's the priority? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, mm, I'm putting a lot of faith in REDD. I think that reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation as an international framework, which I think is encouraging countries to uh, look after forest stock, for example, uh, by actually providing money. Yeah, we'll provide money not to cut them down. I'm, I'm, I don't share your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because they've spent billions on it, oh, t hundreds of millions, and they've achieved very, very little so far, and it's tied up with a lot of land tenure issues. And I, I fear that they've tried to make it too complicated. Okay. It's a bit like forest certification. It's become, they've tried to make it 100% right rather than sort of going for 80% right. Well, I think the scale of the issue, issue is such that 80% right is already better than 40%. No, if, if they stuck with 80%, yeah. that would be OK. Oh, okay. They're trying to make it too perfect. Yes. Right, with that agreement between you, the next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. On the edge of that, that row. I calculate that since you've been talking, we've lost something like 1,500 uh, to um, oh, Stade de France. Um, there was a wonderful film a little while ago called Salmon Fishing in the Yemen. Yes. And I was reminded of it by your uh, analysis of Saudi Arabia. Yes. And the 600,000 uh, gallons per day, was it? Yes. Uh, what happens to that water? Is, it, is the supply of water from the water table in... Uh, 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 Permanent? I mean, is it always going to be there, or is it going to be... No, there? it's yeah. not going and to be there. What happens to the water, then, that is transpired? Is there a local climate change? Well, I mean, the, the, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> the, 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 the effect is twofold. One is that you're, you're affecting the, the actual water cycle in terms of taking fossil water at a remarkable rate and sticking it on the planet's surface where you, there's evapotranspiration and so it's, it's stuck up into the climate system. So yes, there is that. But there's also another effect on the climate system in that if you looked at the very first picture in that sequence, you saw a bright, dry desert. Mm -hmm. And when you looked at the last one, mm -hmm. a chunk of land from Edinburgh going right down to, to England has gone dark. 
and it's gone black, and it's carbon absorbing, CO2 absorbing, but it's, it's having a different effect on the energy exchange and the carbon exchange and the water exchange. So it is having a small scale effect on the, on the climate, but also on the climate system sensor lago. And as far as the, the sustainability of the water is concerned, it's fossil water and it will run out. I'm not going to say when, because I couldn't, but it will run out. Yes, the end of the road. No, the two, that lady first and then down the back, okay. Hi, um, Stephanie Miles, Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Um, I was really interested in um, your your maps of um, where you where you took the soils that are then um, sensitive to climate change, mm. particularly in the UK. You lost about half the <laughs> productive area. Um, wondering what the error bars on that were, firstly, um, and secondly, what hopes you have of using this as a predictive measure for um, where um, soils are likely to be vulnerable, can we implement policies to right. change what crops are being produced mm -hmm. where? Mm -hmm. Good yep. The error bars are enormous, uh, and in fact unknown, but we know they're enormous, um, which is why the Global Soil Partnership and all the rest are needed. Second thing is, be a little bit careful with the maps, because there's a mapping scale issue, and you've got a minimum mapping unit, and that the map the global maps tend to overemphasize things. Uh, so be careful on that one. Um, but as far as use of the soil's information in the, the sort of competition for land, we're, we're not actually, well, my department's not addressing the European situation, but you could. What we're doing is busy crossing the, the, the known soils maps that we have. So we're, we're crossing maps of known soil quality with a 30-year record of land productivity dynamics where we're able to determine whether land production has remained, land productivity, not production, land productivity has remained stable, has improved or declined over those 30 years. And then we're able to look at land use uh, in specific regions. So the, the amount of agricultural land, the amount of forest and population, we're back to population again. And putting all that together to try and make some sensible um, mapping on competition for land. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's related primarily to food security. So it's growing interest in food security. But it will have to come even for the European context where we've signed up to land degradation neutrality. So we will need those maps and we will need to cross them with other maps of soil, of soil properties. Question on that side. <coughs> uh, Alistair Alexander, I would describe myself as a member of the idle poor. <laughs> and my question really is, uh, I thought the presentation was excellent and, and it confirms what I see as a, as a lay person. Uh, and I find it quite terrifying, the prospects. Uh, uh, and I wonder whether we can actually get over these things. But my question really is about the politicians uh, and government. You can answer it in an international context or within the UK. but. From what I can see, what's happening to uh, our lovely country of Scotland and the UK as a whole, it's changing and changing quite dramatically. But yet, if you look at what's happening uh, in, in the, with government and the politicians, they're not speaking about this. Mm. And my worry is that they're not, they don't either appreciate the scale of what's going to happen to our country, or they haven't got the guts to address it, because addressing it effectively may put yeah. them out of government, because it yeah. could be extremely unpopular. So my question yeah. is, are politicians you know, really aware of the significance of this, and do you have, uh, uh, what are your views on their willingness to address the issues? Well, that's a good question. I think there is a willingness to address them. I mean, if you look at the whole debate, I know that the, the REDD may be fallible, <laughs> but at least the governments of the world have listened and heard. The global forests, not just the tropical forests, the global forests are a, an important carbon sink. Maintaining that carbon sink is important. We are trying to find some political mechanism whereby we can protect them. And maybe we're not there yet, but at least they are listened to the science that said we have a problem. In fact, the whole climate change, the reason we even, we even have the REDD process is because the politicians have listened to science to some extent. If I look at the Biological Diversity Convention, 
the decision to increase the protected areas of the world from 12 to 17 percent is based on an understanding of how habitat loss is, is affecting global biodiversity right now. So there has been a political reaction. Rio plus 20, we're going to strive to a land degradation neutral world because science has told us that it's not neutral at the moment. So there is a reaction on that international scale at the level of those big conventions. The teeth that they have and the actual results that they're getting vary in terms of intensity. But there is, there is a move whereby politicians are listening to science, uh, and long may it last. Um, Alan, could I, <coughs> before another question, just um, extend that question a bit to um, the effect on agricultural economics? Uh, um, <coughs> Do you not want me to ask that question? Well, I'm not an economist. <laughs> but, no, but we have economists around. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the, 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 impact, the economic impact of the, of the price of food, mm. um, of the affordability of food between mm. um, rich and poor countries, mm. and the, the constraints now on the areas in which we can produce that, mm. are, must be enormous. And yes. we have to have some idea of how that's going to affect us in future. Yeah, I, I have one, one example which was given to me as a very short, uh, cost-effective means of, of reducing um, land degradation issues in Africa. I was told that if instead of selling fertilizer in 50 kilogram bags, yeah. we sold fertilizer in five kilogram bags, yes. it would have a profound effect because the 50 kilogram bags spend months and months on the dock side when they're delivered, yeah. and which their potency is degraded. Yeah. And then it's a little bit like the drug dealers. It's parceled up into smaller and smaller packets, and each time it's parceled up, it's cut. And so by the time the subsistence farmer who needs the fertilizer gets it, it's old, it's less potent, and it's probably been cut with something else in any case. And, and so if you could cut down the size of it, you'd improve the, the effectiveness of it. That, that's just one short-term yeah. <laughs> example. It's a very practical one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got time for two or three more questions. Yes, Bunny. I'm very ignorant in this, but I feel that the only answer... Bunny, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, and <coughs> I feel the only answer in, in the future is that you get down to making the people aware of what is happening because they have no knowledge of this at all. Most, well, certainly people like me have never heard of it. Yes. And uh, they uh, need to know the importance of what is happening. Well, I, I, again, I, I agree with you, and I praise the organizers, and I thank them for giving me the opportunity to, to stand on my soapbox. Um, but uh, I agree. I think public outreach is vital. And you, you have the center here in Edinburgh, which is, is trying to do the dynamic earth. And, and people are putting more emphasis on communicating science with the public, which is a forerunner to communicating it with the politicians as well. So, yes, we do need to get that message out there, definitely. One, um, more, one more question. Yes, the lady in the center. Pat Gallivan, older housewife. Um, <laughs> I, over the years, I'm always concerned when the question of population growth comes up. It's a motive question, and we're, we have the feeling it's not really politically nice to talk about it. It's not correct to discuss it. Uh, there seems almost to be a feeling that mankind is not a biological creature like any of the others, and that we must be allowed to breed and to slowly strive towards a wonderful world for any number of people we want to have. Now we look at other species and we see that if they overpopulate, it regulates itself in the end mm. through natural disasters, um, disease comes in and kills off many of them, um, famine comes in and kills many of them. I've worked as a volunteer most of my life for Save the Children trying to raise money to feed people who are living in areas where really it doesn't sustain life in those quantities. 
And I think, when are we going to address this fact? Because if we go on and on servicing man and making, using science to produce more and more food where we can, in the end, there's going to be a much bigger biological disaster, I would have thought. I'm not going to ask him to answer that, because I, th I think that is a very appropriate point to make at the end of this lecture. So thank you very much for doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm now going to call um, for a vote of thanks um, on Professor Jeremy Bradshaw, who is Assistant Principal at the University of Edinburgh. And while he walks to the podium, I should say that I t began by talking about Peter Wilson. Peter Wilson's Widow Bunny is here. She comes to all of these lectures. Welcome again, Bunny. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure on behalf of you all to thank uh, Dr. Bellwood for um, a most interesting lecture, very wide ranging, covering history of, of land imaging right the way through to its use um, to, to monitor land usage and so on. Peter Wilson, we've already uh, heard him described as a dynamo uh, for his work uh, here at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He also found time to be vice president of the Institute of Biology, as it was in those days, and on another occasion, its secretary. And he was secretary during the period that uh, the society successfully negotiated a royal charter. And I'm sure that he was heavily involved in that work. Of course, the Society of Biology, as we've heard, became the Institute of Biology became the Society of Biology in 2009. And it now has some 14,000 members and about 90 member organizations. It's on behalf of those members, on behalf of the partners in sponsoring tonight's event, the SCRR and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, but mostly on behalf of all of you here, that it gives me great pleasure to thank Dr. Bellwood for such a, a, a most interesting, a thought provoking, and sobering lecture. Thank you.